Germany could occupy all of France. Germany could imprison French soldiers and enforce French labor. But she could not seize the navy of the country she had defeated. Frenchmen saw to that when they scuttled their battleships on the day the Germans tried to seize them in the harbor at Toulon. And all of the navy was not at Toulon. The battleship Richelieu, 35,000 ton pride of the French, had been crippled in combat while firing on the British under orders from Vichy. The crew of the Richelieu broke with the men of Vichy and sailed to New York to join in the war against fascism and to carry on the fight of her sister ships lying at the bottom of Toulon Harbor. After several months at a secret American dry dock, the Richelieu was reconditioned. It was the first step towards the victorious homecoming these men dream about. They haven't seen France for four years. But they can play the songs they remember and talk with their padre about home. These sailors had been helplessly beached at Dakar for two years, watching rust and neglect destroy their ship. Now they're ready to get back into the fight again. Some of these sailors are mates of the men who went down on their ships to Toulon. Some of them are sons or brothers of soldiers who were killed or captured by the Germans in 1939. All of them are Frenchmen. And a battleship with a fighting crew, a speed of 32 knots, and a battery of 15-inch guns speaks the kind of fighting French Germans understand. While the reconditioned Richelieu sails back to a combat zone, Native troops from the French possession of Martinique are trained in American methods of warfare at a camp in New Jersey. Their language is different, but the equipment is the same as is issued to American soldiers. These troops are famous fighters, and in the United States they learn the organization and teamwork of modern infantry and the use of modern weapons. They make tough soldiers and welcome allies, and they'll fight until they can help carry the French flag back into France. in the United States, French airmen arrive from Africa. The war is four years old for them, and equipment has changed since their days of combat before the fall of France. They come to America to learn the use of new equipment. An aerial gunnery school in Florida is their destination. They already know about strafing. Hi, fella, where'd you come from? I came from North Africa. Where's your home? I was in Paris, but I have not been there since 1940. Did you run up against any Nazis? Yes, I left Paris one day before the German captivity. We were walking on the road and one German plane strafed us. I was lucky, but uh, 42 others were killed. These men had to fight for a chance to fight. They had to risk a death sentence in escaping. They had to kill German guards to cross the borders of their occupied country. The guns they're training with now are a great improvement over the guns that were lost at the fall of France. And this time, they have plenty of ammunition. They knew the character of the enemy long before they entered gunnery school. On graduation day, Americans and Frenchmen get their wings together. Two flags, two peoples fighting side by side. On the American side, there's Alex Bishop. His family lives in North Carolina. They know he's getting his wings today, and they're mighty proud. Henri Chavignard's family live in France, in a town called Rochefort. They don't know that he's getting his wings today. Henri doesn't know if his family is living or dead. And he never will know. 
until he and Bishop and millions of others have forced the fascists to unconditional surrender. When the Japs captured the steaming jungles and large plantations of the Far East, they opened up a serious problem, for it was here that thousands of natives tapped, cured, and processed rubber for the United Nations. The United States received 97% of its supply from this area. Immediately, the country faced one of its greatest industrial crises. A substitute had to be found for natural rubber. Flying Fortress needs half a ton. Every tank, almost a ton. A battleship, 75 tons. It was a synthetic rubber process or lose the war. The battle for rubber was on. Today, two years later, that battle is being waged victoriously. A formula was discovered and giant plants were speedily erected to make synthetic rubber, including this one at Louisville, Kentucky. All processes are secret, of course, but most chemists know that synthetic rubber can be made out of almost anything from dandelions to corn. This plant uses corn, and it's figured about two bushels of corn to make one rubber tire. A highly important factor in rubber is its tensile strength. Synthetic rubber has a number of advantages over natural rubber. Note the few workers in these scenes. A native, if he's good, collects a single ton of natural rubber in a year. Here, each worker turns out 60 tons annually. 10,000 workers in the United States are equivalent to a million natives in the Far East. A rubber tree can produce only one kind, while a synthetic rubber plant makes many kinds for all purposes. As for strength and durability, the latest synthetic processes perfected by the nation's top chemists are better than any before found for natural rubber. Not that the battle has been an easy one. The government invested $750 million to build this industry, and it was 11 months before our first factory was turning out synthetic rubber. After the rubber goes through these huge oven dryers where all moisture is removed, it is folded and then plied. Finally, it's weighed in 75 pound stacks and then dusted with soapstone so it won't deteriorate during shipment to other plants. Today, Practically all the synthetic rubber made is being used for war equipment. The Army needs it for tires, and tires are needed for jeeps, tanks, half-track carriers, and planes. The Army also needs it for the barrage balloon. It is used for lifeboats by the Navy and for rubber boots. The Navy has converted 60% of its crude rubber requirements to synthetic rubber, including this latest model life belt. And here we have a neatly packed one-man lifeboat ready for any emergency. Quickly and with a minimum of effort, the lifeboat is automatically inflated. Yes, Tojo has the rubber plantations, and his soldiers are wearing shoes with rubber heels two inches thick. But thanks to American ingenuity and imagination, the United States is going to have enough rubber for its urgent wartime needs. And this is a synthetic rubber life vest better known among the many sailors and aviators who have used it as a May West. Back home, the kids still start planning for Christmas sometime around Thanksgiving. Maybe the delivery truck has something for them. Maybe not. War has made a difference in Christmas to the kids. Don't worry, John, it's nothing for you. It might be. No, John, this is going to be a small Christmas. I looked through the closets last night, and there were only two packages. Here I am at a time like this. Four brothers fighting Captain Nash. War has made a difference in Christmas to a lot of fighting men. Men kept away from their families by the urgent business of war. Morning collision report, Captain. Very well, sir. Cruiser reported brought on the Fort Bean. Very well. Take a bearing, Mr. Miller. Aye, sir. But there was time enough and thoughtfulness enough for them to write a letter. Manager, Children's Department, R.H. Macy and Company, New York City, New York. Dear sir, 
encloses a check for $2,404.25, for which we ask you to give us the following service. One, select a Christmas gift or gifts valued at approximately $3 for each of the 729 children listed in enclosures A and B. We are so far removed from home in both time and distance that we have little idea of what kind of gifts may be available this year. We shall therefore not limit you in choice. Two, wrap and mail your selections to the home address of the listed children. We are sending our order early in the hope that you will be able to get your selections in the mail before the Christmas rush starts. May we suggest that each package be marked, do not open before Christmas. Three, please enclose with each package a gift card reading as follows. For sons and daughters, Merry Christmas from your dad and his shipmates in the USS North Carolina. Please acknowledge this order at your earliest convenience. By that, we do not mean that you tell us what you selected for each child. The children will tell us that in due time and in their own inimitable manner. You will be adding greatly to the happiness of our children and to our own Christmas joy out here in one of the war zones. Very truly yours, E.P. Wubbins, Chaplain, U.S. Navy. A combat zone is a long way from home on any day in the year, but it's twice as far away from home on Christmas. Men with photographs in their wallets, sometimes of children they've never seen. Photographs of their kid brothers and sisters. Photographs of the people back home they've never forgotten. There wasn't time for these men to wrap packages or fill stockings, but there was time for them to see that a kid brother in Oregon got a baseball bat, that a daughter in Massachusetts got a doll. These are the men who wrote the letter, and this is their ship, the USS North Carolina. Back in New York City, kids from the neighborhood, sons and daughters and brothers and sisters of the men aboard the Carolina, kids who have never seen one another before, get together at a party to talk about their men at sea and to wish them a Merry Christmas through the Army-Navy screen magazine. Mike, I want you to meet my brother John and I. Hi. Hi, Mike. Mike, what does your brother do? My brother packs a machinist, mate. Well, our brother Reddy's a lieutenant. He's in charge of the fire control. That's well. Most of the kids are too young to know what the war's all about yet. But they do know that their fathers and brothers will be away until people all over the world will be able to celebrate Christmas in their own homes. And there will be peace on Earth again and goodwill to all men. And Daddy told me to give you a nice big kiss. Who are all these children, Eleanor? These are my four sisters. And our brother Fred is a gunner's mate. How would you all like to say hello to Fred? Merry, Merry Christmas, Christmas, Fred. Merry Christmas, Johnny. Merry Christmas, Louie. Merry Christmas, Louie. bright sunny day with the air fresh and clean. Not a rumor was stirring except <clears throat> in the latrine. Hiya, Snafu. What's new? Oh, nothing much. Nice day. Nice day for a bombing. Yeah, nice bombing weather. Mm. Bombing weather. Bombing weather. Sounds harmless enough. Innocent stuff. 
But let's take a look in and find out what's cooking. Bombing weather. Bombing weather. Bombing weather. Bombing weather. Bombing weather. Just between you and me, pal, I hear we're in for a bombing. The hot air is blowing. A rumor is growing. They're gonna bomb us. They're gonna bomb us. They're about to bombing. They're about to bombing. They bombed us. Did you hear about the terrible bombing last night? Well, I heard it on good authority. Back up a storm. Balloon juice. It's phony, but uh, it makes nice baloney. That's right. Exaggerate it. Stretch it. Multiply it. Now, shoot off your face. Baloney is flying all over the place. Worst air raid of the war. Yeah. They blasted hell out of Brooklyn Bridge. Coney Island was wiped out. What's the matter with our planes? They popped them off like kites. Them parachute troops landed right on the White House lawn. The Florida coast is lousy with invasion barges. Did you know that we have nothing to fight with? That our shells are all duds? <laughs> and furthermore, the jobs are in California! <laughs> Until you see their new secret weapon. This may surprise you, but they're attacking this very camp. The British are quitting! <laughs> the Chinese gave up! <laughs> it's all over. We've lost the war. Ain't it? <laughs> <laughs>